Good morning. Welcome each and every one of you to Faith Lutheran Church on this Wednesday morning for our uh, Wednesday morning Bible class entitled Ancient Heresies, Modern Cults. If you are joining us on the live stream, uh, maybe for the first time, I'm Pastor Rob Harbin. Just a moment, Pastor Clayton Sellers is going to be running into the frame with coffee. And he didn't spill a drop, so he's doing very well. Uh, we're glad that you're, you're sharing this time with us. This is no, uh, class number two out of seven. Today we are moving on. Uh, we covered the Gnostic, the Gnostic heresy last week, at least in the basics. Um, today we move on to Arius and Arianism in the ancient church, how the ancient church addressed that, and what is modern day Arianism, and I don't, oh, I do have my phone. Yeah, I, I don't know where my, I don't, I'm totally discombobulated today. So, so we're, the, the office is getting all moved around, and so the moving crew is here. And my microphone's now on. The, the moving crew is here, and so everything's all discombobulated out in the narthex and in the office, and everything's just all, is, all asunder. Anyway. Anyway. Glad you're here. Uh, there are study guides back there. Uh, hopefully, uh, if you're following the online class, you can uh, download the online version of the study guide. But we're gonna, we've are gonna we got a lot to cover today, and we're already five minutes behind. We uh, never get started five minutes late. So uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Yes. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, you are the Word made flesh. Uh, you were there at the beginning. Uh, indeed, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Uh, you are from eternity. And yet there are so many who have misunderstood your nature and your person. Uh, And we ask that you would bless us today as we talk about the ancient heresies of of how people misunderstood who you were uh, and how that uh, wreaked havoc in the life of the church, how the church responded. And yet today, 2,000 years later, um, the uh, modern day America and the world in which we live still misunderstands your, your person and your nature. Help us to be clear in our proclamation from Scripture alone, and may all that you hear be pleasing in your sight. Uh, in your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we didn't even write anything up on the board. The it's going to be terrible. So one thing we should put out straight away, because of the, the world that we live in, we're talking about Arianism, with an I and not with a Y, right? So there's a, you'll remember from your World War II history, the the idea of the Aryan race and and Hitler's Hitler's, um, idea to to get the pure Aryan race, A-R-Y-A-N. We are not talking about that. So we are talking about a guy by the name of Arius with an I. And so people who followed in his footsteps and in his teachings are... It's confusing for us, but it wasn't confusing before 1940 uh, or before the 30s, I guess, the 1930s. They are called Aryans, but it's two separate, yeah. two separate ordeals, um, and it, it's just a weird quirk of the English language, um, but it needs to get put out there uh, straight away as a, as a thing that might pop up in your head. All right, so Arius is this guy who lived um, in the 300s, uh, but... The first point that I want to make is really kind of a, a review that, that sets up the rest of this class, that the most potent lie in the church is a lie with a kernel of truth. Okay, you should have that memorized by now. The most potent lie in the church is a lie with a kernel of truth. Uh, Gnosticism uh, incorporated a kernel of truth. And I would, I would argue that Arius <laughs> incorporated even more truth mm-hmm. Uh, into his doctrines, uh, into his teachings. And we'll we'll unpack that as we move along. And the next teaching point is this. The single greatest threat, and this is really important, to Orthodox Christianity in the first 300 plus years of the New Testament church were the followers of Arius. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about that. uh, But first things first, we want to get to what were the basics of of Arius' teaching, um, and how did they uh, get such a grip on the life of the church? So, uh, Pastor Clayton, who was Arius? Can you introduce us to this guy? Yeah, so Arius, I 
forget if he was a bishop. He was a bishop. He was a, so he was a, a leader in the church. Hold on, I forgot to turn my volume down. Um, he was a leader in the church. So he had the training and he had standing and he had a congregation. And he, he was a, a proclaimer and a preacher of the word. Do you know what city he was bishop? Was it, was it Smyrna or Alexandria? It was Alexandria. Alexandria. So, so rem, and this is an important bit of history, right? So Alexandria, Egypt was a major metropolitan area, was a major crossroads of the Mediterranean world. There was Alexandria, and there was Antioch, and there was uh, Constantinople, or what would eventually become Constantinople, and Rome. Those were the big cities around the Mediterranean. And so, um, and then some of the, like the seven churches of, of Revelation, those churches in Asia Minor, they had major standing. Uh, and so a lot of the controversies and, and the, heresies, the heresies, but then the, the writers who come out uh, arguing against those heresies come from a, a handful of places around the Mediterranean. But it's important you, you understand that Alexandria itself was one of the five greatest, they call them seas, yeah. S-E-E, -E, uh, one of the five greatest theological powerhouses mm -hmm. of the ancient Christian church. The five were in this, probably in this order, uh, uh, Rome, Constantinople, Jerusalem, Antioch, and then Alexandria. And, and, and Arius ends up being bishop of the church in Alexandria, which had it literally, folks, what you, uh, think of it this way. Um, how many seminaries does the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod have? Two. Two. Where are they located? St. Well, uh, Dr. Two, uh, and, Dr. Pavel would always th always throws in St. Catherine. All right, so I'm talking to... about uh, in in, uh, in the United States. Uh, in the America. United States, yeah, two. We have two, right? Well, those uh, those basically represented five different theological schools, mm -hmm. and one whole school was ruled or overseen yep. by a guy named Darius. Yep. So uh, he had power. He had sway. Uh, and he taught, let's get into these basics. So number one, uh, and, and folks, just like last week, remember, we're not going to cover everything. We just don't have time in 60 minutes, well, 55 minutes to cover every detail of Arius um, and the ancient church. Uh, but we're going to cover the basics. Arius taught a hierarchical relationship between God the Father and God the Son. Yep. So when we say that, Pastor Clayton... What do we mean by a hierarchical yeah. relationship, uh, so, you know, using that study guide as your... Yeah, as so, your... so you could also add, um, we could say, uh, well, sub, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sub, not submission. Anyway, so hierarchical, so that the Father was a, was a more divine of a higher power, of a higher authority, and Jesus, uh, in, a, in a couple of different ways, Arius and his followers would talk about this, but that Jesus... In some way, shape, uh, so subordination, that's the word I was looking for. That Jesus was subordinated under the Father, that's how he talked about it. Or in this hierarchical, role. so that Jesus was not fully divine, or that uh, Jesus was similar to the Father, but not exactly the same as the Father, um, or that they were uh, two separate gods, or two separate gods in a hierarchical or subordinationist sort of way, or... Um, uh, and maybe we'll get into this, maybe that Jesus was man but was adopted in, that he was a creature but that got adopted in or got given something. And so he, he breaks up the Godhead. He, he breaks up the Trinity. And, and from this flows out a conversation on the Holy Spirit, which is for another day. Um, but the Trinity gets broken up into, instead of three and one, just becomes sort of this two... But the Father's really the true God, and, this, and Jesus is something less than. All right. So if you're looking at this on the whiteboard, if you're looking at this from kind of a, um, an, a, a visual perspective, the Father is true God. All right? He's true God. The Son is not fully God. And so He's below the Father and the Holy Spirit, as Pastor Clayton just said, okay, is even lower. So there seems to be, in Arius' theology, a ranking of the, the persons of the Trinity. The Father being completely divine, the Son being 
still divine, but not quite. But not the same. fully, not fully divine, and the Holy Spirit being uh, of a lesser right. uh, quantity than the Father and the Son. And so you have this hierarchical understanding of the persons of the Trinity, and this leads to some significant problems. Now, this is of interest, um, and, and I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit, but. Um, Unlike Gnosticism, which was outside the church, Arianism ends, uh, ends up within the walls mm -hmm. of the church uh, and uses the scriptures themselves. Turn in your Bibles very quickly, uh, for example, to John 4, 6. Just go to John 4, 6 and, um, and go ahead and look up Matthew 24, 36 as well because I know you are multitasking people and you've got fingers and, and, uh, and papers and pens and pencils that you can kind of ribbon your Bibles with. Uh, but you want to look up John 4, 6 and Matthew 24, 36. Um, Pastor Clayton, can you read John 4, 6 for us? Uh, so he's, Jesus is with the Samaritan woman there at the well. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. All right, so uh, Arius reads verses like this. And, and uh, what did you just hear from John 4, 6? Yeah, okay. You heard uh, of, of that person of Jesus, the, the, um, the human, you read the human nature of Jesus. What happened to Jesus during his earthly ministry? As a human being. He got tired. Eventually, he would die, right? I mean, he's going to suffer death, which is the ultimate human thing, right? Um, but uh, Arius reads into texts like this where uh, Jesus wept, Jesus slept, Jesus... Um, wept? Did you say wept? I already said oh, wept. Slept, yeah, because it rhymes with, yeah. with slept, yeah. wept, and he, sl you got that? What? He ate. He ate. He ate. He ate if food. you're from England, he ate. All right. <laughs> he ate so, his food. I mean, who eats? Human beings eat. Gods don't eat. Gods do not eat. Do gods cry? Nope. Gods don't cry. Do gods sleep? I mean, we have a psalm that says God doesn't sleep. Psalm 100. God does not slumber, nor does he sleep, the psalmist writes. So Arius reads into these texts, and he sees Jesus as something less than God. And he, uh, he literally pulls apart the whole conversation right. on the personhood of Jesus Christ. Right. Right, so be, so we would we would, so the technical term for this is the the hypostatic union that in a mysterious way that we fall down in faith and awe and marvel at is that God became flesh that God took on flesh that the second person of the Trinity came down and entered the world for the purpose of redeeming the world and he joined himself fully God and fully man and that's the and that's the core and the heart mystery yeah. and I think we're going to touch on this towards the end. That's the, the core and the heart mystery of, of our salvation and our redemption is this joining fully God and fully man. It, doesn't, it, doesn't make, it does not make rational sense that All right. one, God would do it, or two, that it could happen, and yet it does. Yeah, I call this God's math. Mm -hmm. All right, how much was Jesus God? 100%. 100%. How much was Jesus man? 100%. If you add 100 plus a 100, what do you get? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Which doesn't make sense, right? It's God's math. Now, uh, I'll give you another little, as a parallel thought on God's math. What does God expect from you to get into everlasting life? What percent of, of perfection? 100 percent. 100%. The Bible says if you break the law at just one point, what do you get? A 99? Nope, you get a zero. You get a zero. Isn't that interesting? 100 minus 1 equals 99, but in God's math, it equals zero. zero. And yet, through faith in Jesus Christ, the one God man who has accomplished everything on the cross and out of the grave for you, what do you get? The fullness. 100%, right? Zero plus 1 equals 1, but in God's math, it equals perfection this is the this is the math of god god's math doesn't make sense and so yes we believe that jesus is fully god we believe that he's fully man somehow arius gets this he starts to throw in percentages he starts to mess around with 
qua- uh, quantifying mm-hmm. the person of Jesus Christ. Another one, uh, Matthew 24, 36. If you've already looked that one up, uh, I've got this one memorized because I've taught so many classes on the end times. But this is Jesus saying, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man, that, that hour when Christ will return. And I'm paraphrasing. Mm-hmm. Now, how is it that the second person of the Trinity does not know when he's, he's going to return? Well, he's clearly less than. Yeah, exactly. So Arius plays around with stuff like this. He misinterprets it, and he makes Jesus a less than the Father. So it's definitely a downgrade. Uh, there's a hierarchical relationship, and hopefully you can see the dangers that are here. Um, number two, God the Father existed before God the Son. So God the Father uh, existed before the Son, so which, which, which means the Son is not eternal. That is correct. So the, the catchphrase the catchphrase for uh, the Arians, and they even put this into a, into a hymn uh, of something along these lines. There was a time when Jesus wasn't. Yeah. All right. Stop and just put that into your brains for a moment. If Jesus, if there was a time when Jesus was not, well, I mean, again, what are they saying of Jesus? That he's not fully what? God. God. And if he's not fully God, then that has repercussions for your salvation. That has repercussions for not just who he is, but our standing before God himself based on Scripture. Um, In fact, uh, the Son has a beginning. This is a statement of Arius. Uh, You can read uh, Romans 8, 29 on your own. But what we want to do now is look at, real quick, John 1, verses 1 through 4. So this is quintessentially one of the best proof texts in all of the Bible. I mean, there are others, but this is probably the most clearest Mm -hmm. statement that's made in the Bible about the eternal nature of the second person of the Trinity. And if you, I have it memorized from the NIV, uh, but, uh, and if you don't mind, Pastor Clayton, I'm going to, I'm just going to go through those first four verses uh, as I have it in my mind, all right? Hopefully you are all there in first, uh, excuse me, John 1, 1 through 4. Um, how does John begin the, that, that, that book? How does he begin the whole passage? Okay, when John says in the beginning, what does he want you, the reader, to do? Think of Genesis. He wants you to connect with Genesis. John is very intentional. He says in the beginning... What is the only other book in the entire Bible that starts with in the beginning? Yeah, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. So, automatically you're going to Genesis 1-1, and this is what John writes. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things that were made were made through him, and nothing that has been made was made apart or without him. So what did John just say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was with him in the beginning. All things were made through him, and nothing that has been made was made apart from him. What's going on here? Talking about the second person, the the eternity of the second person of the Trinity. This is the eternity of the second person of the Trinity. This is Jesus. You know him as Jesus. No, of course. He was not always named Jesus. Okay? Um, In his his incarnation, he he takes the name Jesus. He takes the name Jesus. But he's been given multiple names uh, throughout Scripture, like... Uh, well, so he shows up throughout the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, the Malach Yahweh. Uh, the, Isaiah calls him the Prince of Peace, wonderful, wonderful counselor. counselor. Uh, he's the Lion of Judah. The Lion of Judah. The, sta- uh, the star, the star that's going to rise up. Right? In Isaiah seven fourteen, he's called Emmanuel. Mm-hmm. I mean, he gets he gets multiple names. You know him as Jesus the Christ because two thousand years ago he came into this world and took on human flesh. Uh, but he always has been. This is what Arius gets wrong. 
this is what Arius um, uh, basically misinterprets from Scripture. His, his, his human reasoning and rationality uh, leads him down this slippery, dangerous, heretical slope. Now, here's the no. Oh, go ahead. Question. Yeah. All right, so that, yeah. that, that is exactly where I'm headed. So thank you for the segue. Uh, so on your study guide, uh, please note Gnosticism was easily dismissed by the early church. Arianism was an infiltration from within. Uh, also of interest is that Arius only used Scripture. He didn't, yeah. he didn't which, use Gnostic texts. Right, or which like is that. an important thing. We talked about Dan Brown last week. And one of, the, one of the lies that Dan Brown promulgates and, and get, has been picked up by secular scholars is that the Council of Nicaea, which Nicaea is like a suburb of Constantinople. Um, uh, the, so the, the lie is that the Council of Nicaea sat down and voted which books of the Bible were in and which books of the Bible were out. That is not the case. We talked about this last week that the the, the New Testament, as we've received it, was well established by then. And both sides of this controversy, because the Council of Nicaea happens in response to Arius. The church, as it existed then, gathers all their leaders to, talk, to address Arius. And they're both talking out of the same Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. So there's no debate about, oh, this book's, you're using this book and I'm using this book. They're using the same compendium, the same library of Old Testament and New Testament texts, and it's a matter of interpretation. How bad was it in the life of the church? How close was Arius and his theology in taking over ancient Christendom? Uh, so after the Council of Nicaea, um, once, so Constantine, for better or for worse, whatever Constantine does, Constantine comes down on the side of orthodoxy, on what, what's referred to as the faith of Nicaea. After Constantine dies and, he, and his authority and power to kind of hold things in place, once he dies, his son actually becomes emperor, and his son is a follower of Arius. And so for the next three to four hundred years, over half of the, what we would think of as the Roman Empire, even though it's being run by the Visigoths and the Vandals and whatever, um, that the, there is a, a strain of I'll call it Christianity, but there's a part, about half the church is following the teachings of Arius, that Jesus existed, that Jesus died on the cross, but he's not eternal, and that he's not fully divine. Um, and so it, for, for multiple centuries, the Orthodox faith, faith and the Arian faith are uh, existing side by side and continuing to fight. This is so interesting, folks, okay, how close... How close was it? There, are, there is a church in Italy, okay, that has a baptistry, an Orthodox baptistry, and an Arian baptistry. That's how close this competition was at, 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 uh, at one point in the ancient church because they were constantly at odds with each other. If it had not been for this uh, Council of Nicaea that basically laid the foundation for Orthodox Christianity, um, well, who knows where we would be right now? But guys, by the uh, guys like Athanasius, mm -hmm. you've heard of him because we confess his creed on Holy Trinity. All right, it's not he didn't write it, but he he, he, gave, was, he was such a strong defender of the Trinity and great writer about he, the Trinity. He went he went head to head with Arius yeah. on multiple occasions. It's named Arius. It. Uh, excuse me, Athanasius was actually exiled uh, like 17, yeah. umpteen, he was exiled umpteen times by oh. the emperor because the emperor just kept vacillating back and forth over, is it Arius? Is it orthodoxy? Is it Arius? Is it orthodoxy? And so Athanasius uh, walked with a limp because he was tortured for standing up against Arius. This is how bad it was in the life of the church. So if you ever go to a Lutheran church and they're arguing about the color of the carpet <laughs> or, or what color the next chairs are going to be, um, be thankful that you're not putting each other uh, right. in prison and torturing each other over these kind of things because Athanasius was truly tortured because he stood up for the faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. They, they had worship services like at the Council of Nicaea. They, they, would ha- they, they had a corporate worship together. Now, whether everybody communed together or not, right. um, that, that, that's debatable. Uh, there may be some historical yeah. uh, data on that, actually. And so just, uh, by, just by way of extra information about the Council of Nicaea, this was a weeks-long endeavor with the, with the bishops, the leaders of the church, and all of their, their secretaries and supporting theologians and the scholars. And the emperor was there with all of his retinue. And the emperor actually paid for this and was putting everybody up. Um, and so they, they kind of took over the town, the town of Nicaea for at least, it, it was at least a month. And if you ever wonder, if you ever wonder why we take minutes at church council meetings or voters meetings or whatever, is because, well, we still have the minutes from the council of Nicaea. We still, that's why we can say what we can say about this is because those records of the writings and the decisions and the votes that they took and the conversations that they had were written down and have been passed down through the centuries for us to continue to, to see Which where, is pretty cool where stuff. we stand. So this is what the church did in response to Arius, because we've got to move on. We've got to get to uh, modern Arianism. Um, we say this today in the Nicene Creed. You probably have it memorized. And this is what um, you were asking about, Cheryl. The, we, we, what, do we, what do we confess about the second person of the Trinity? So I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And of all things uh, visible and invisible. Of all things visible and invisible. And His only begotten Son. Uh, and the, yeah. So and the on, only begotten is the first key word there, right? The only begotten is the first key word. What does it mean to be only begotten? So we, if we start with only, there's just, there's just the one. Right. There's the one Son from the Father. Begotten. What does it mean to be begotten? So, begot, so as we say in the Creed, right? Begotten, not made, not Well, created. we haven't gotten there yet. Oh, so we're unpa- so we have to unpack that first line. Only begotten Son of God. So we're basically saying that the Son proceeds from the Father. But this does not mean the Son is created. He proceeds from the Father. Are they co-equal and eternal? Yes. Yes. But is the Son son subordinate to the Father? Only in regard to His human nature as He carries out His salvific work on this earth. Not according to His divine nature. So... He's only begotten, begotten of his father before all worlds. Here we go. God of God. Y'all know how this goes. Light of light. Light of light. You can say it out loud, John. Go ahead, say it. Very God God of very God. So what were the people at Nicaea trying to communicate to Arius? Over and over and over again. It's almost as if, and this is really kind of the image. How many times? I know, John, you're probably pretty good at pounding a nail into wood. You, can, you only have to do it once, right? And you, like, get it in. Is that, I'm, bam! I'm a master carpenter. You're a master carpenter, bam! Well, I can't do that. So how many times do I have to hit the nail? Multiple times. Numerous times, from, how, right? How many nails do you have to use? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I am not Jesus the carpenter, okay? <laughs> You know the saying, measure twice, cut once. Yes. Well, Jesus laughed at that. He went, ha, 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 ha. measure once, my friend, measure once. Because he's, he's Jesus. Perfect. He's Jesus, yeah. All right, so how many times do you have to hit the nail to get it to go into the wood? Multiple times. If, when you confess the words of the Nicene Creed, that's the image. How many times are they pounding this into Arius? Begotten of the Father, God of God, light of light. Very God of very God. Begotten, not made. They're, they're, they're hammering him. Because they want to make it abundantly clear, overwhelmingly clear, that this hierarchical uh, schematic of the Trinity is false. It doesn't work. If Jesus is less than divine, then folks, your salvation is less than secure. Right. And I hope you got that. I hope you're, you're listening. So, that's why the Nicene Creed literally says what it says. It is, it is in direct response to Arius. They're pounding it into him. 
So one, um, just on, on the, the phrase light of light, one, and the, we, they included the phrase light of light because one of the ways that Arius and his followers would talk about the relationship between the Father and the Son is they would say that the Father was the, the S-U-N Son and that the ray of light was, is the Son of God. And so, so that they're related and they're similar and they're connected still, but the ray of light is different than the actual S-U-N sun. And so, that's how, and so when we say light of light, we're saying, no, it's not the, the orb and the ray, it's the, it's the same in the yeah. divinity. And then finally, the last nail, uh, the last uh, hammer stroke is that statement, being of one, we say this in the creed, one what? Substance. Substance with the Father by whom all things were made. made. One substance. Arius used the term like substance in the Greek. And I gave you the Greek uh, just you know, for, for, for giggles. Um, but like substance, the, 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 the confessors at Nicaea said of the same substance. You are actually confessing against Arius every time you say the words of the Nicene Creed, which is pretty cool, right? I mean, you are literally echoing history's rebuttal and rebuke of this, this heretic. Uh, heretic. Yeah. Which is one of the, you know, when we, sometimes people will talk about, oh, I, would, I, just, want to take, I just want to take the church back to the, to the earliest times and when, when things were, were more pure and less corrupted and, and this sort of thing. Well, if we, go, if we go back, we have to fight these things again. This is our heritage to say, no, we've, we've wrestled with this stuff. We have this confession of faith, this, this way of articulating the, the divine truths and the divine mysteries. At some point, we can, we can say a lot about the, the union, the, the, the divinity and the, and the humanity of Christ coming together. But at some point, we, got, we fall down in faith and say, look, this is how you've revealed it. We're going to be faithful to the scriptures um, and, and, the, and the confession of the church that we're a part of. And, and I would also, this is just a side note. This is not part of the class today. But um, there are some denominations today who disavow creedal statements. They say... Deeds, not creeds. Uh, I'm not going to name those denominations. I've been reading more about them most recently as I try to understand more about some of the other uh, denominations here in Collarville. Right here on, on, uh, on, on Bahalia Road, as a matter of fact. But the bottom line is that there are many denominations that disavow the creeds. When you disavow the creedal statements, you open yourselves up to this stuff. That's why there are creedal statements. That's why the Nicene Creed says what it says. They were firing back at Arius, and you do every time. You're firing back at modern day Arianism mm -hmm. every time you make the uh, you make profession of of those words, uh, being of one substance. You, you ever wonder where that comes from? Mm -hmm. With the Father, by all things, uh, by whom all things were made, it comes because people question Jesus. They they um, attacked him. So, um, one last little footnote here. True or false? Mm -hmm. Santa Claus punched Arius in the face? He did. True story? True story. So, uh, a guy, Nicholas of... In, 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 it's, it's Ankara, Turkey now. Um, in Syrah? Anyway, his name was Nicholas. He, became, he becomes Saint Nick. Um, and we get Santa Claus from the, I think, the Polish pronunciation of it. But anyway... Saint, Saint Nicholas was there as a bishop of the church, and he got so fed up with Arius twisting the scriptures and denying the divinity of Jesus that he gets up and he punched Arius in the face. Uh, the emperor has him arrested. He gets put in jail for the night, and then he comes back um, and continues on in, in the council of Nicaea. These things happen. So, <laughs> Jeff. It was mo oh, it, Arianism uh, did not dominate in the western church it definitely dominated more in the eastern church mm -hmm. it dominated more towards uh the regions around alexandria of course where arius was a uh, bishop at the time um, there was there was some some missionary work though up into like what we would call the balkans and even up into germany as the as the goths and the Visig visigoths they 
they took hold of this because it made sense in their mind. And they started and, to, to and, spread and, and, it. And what, he, what Pastor Clayton just said is, is perfect. It made sense in their minds. What did ultimately, what did Arius use to interpret Scripture? Human reason. His brain. He used human reason to interpret Scripture. And, and unfortunately, again, I'm going to butt up against other uh, theologians from other denominations. You cannot use human reason to interpret Scripture. Scripture is the Word of God. Um, and if we try to insert human reason, then we put our brains and our reason and our rationale above Scripture as the, as the, critical, mm -hmm. as the critical method. Okay? Uh, we have to subject our brains, subject our reason and our rationale to Scripture, especially when we don't understand it. We don't understand all of Scripture. So to try and reason it out, well, God must mean this because, you know, I mean, that's the way we think. That is to fashion God in your own image. Mm -hmm. um, this is why Lutheranism is so difficult for a lot of people uh, because Lutheran... Uh, Lutheran theology we lets do. Scripture, A, interpret Scripture, and when we don't understand it, we let it stand on its own. We just leave it alone. You know, we don't try and, 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 and rationalize it away. Uh, we just um, yeah. confess it. Right. You know, it's the Word of God. We don't know, we don't know everything. We don't have all the answers. Yep. So I know we've, we've uh, gone... Uh, any questions or comments before we um, dive into modern day Arianism? So let's get into this. Um, modern Arianism of the first kind. Very quickly, we're just going to hit the highlights here. But a guy by the name of Charles Taze Russell, he shows up on the scene in 1879 with his Watchtower News. And the Tract Society, right? And the Tract Society. And... Um, what comes out of Charles Taze Russell is, of course, Jehovah's Witnesses. There's one down here on... They send, they send me letters at uh, Christmas and Easter inviting me to come and learn about something. Uh, you should go. Just wear your collar and just say, hey, I brought my Greek New Testament and my well, Hebrew oh, Old Testament. So I'm going to preach today. That, but that's what, they, that's what they do, though, is they... The Jehovah's Witnesses, and I know this isn't on the study guide, Jehovah's Witnesses take John 1, 1 through 4... And they miss against all scholarship, against all um, Greek grammar rules given to us through all the centuries. Um, they take John 1, 1 through 4, and they say the word was a God. And the word was, uh, and they, they make it to be, right. they, sub, they subordinate the second person of the Trinity in their interpretation. And they do it based on... Uh, it's not. It's not a. It's not. That it's, it's a, a total mishandling of the grammar. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, it's not even. We're not even talking about the theology. It's just the rules of grammar, and they're breaking the rules of oh, Greek grammar. I get it. To to satisfy their own, to get to their it's, own conclusion. It's crazy. Jehovah's Witnesses literally set aside the rules of grammar in ancient Greek and Hebrew to accomplish whatever theology they want to accomplish. This is how they do it. You wonder, wow, I mean, they're reading the Bible because they do use the same Bible that we use. And yet they say Jesus is not Lord. In John chapter 20, when Jesus revealed his scars to Thomas and his hands and his feet and his side, what did Thomas say to Jesus in that moment? You're God. Oh, no. My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Plain and simple. Jehovah's Witnesses completely ignore it and say, no, 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 no. They change the grammar. They just change it. It's bizarre. So uh, JW is, uh, uh, to, to Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus is a mere angel. So they don't see him as God. So look up here at this kind of hierarchical, um, you know, relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, they do the same thing. The Son is not divine. Uh, this is one of their big things. This is one of their big mantras. Jesus is not Lord. <laughs> He's not Lord. So they see the Father as true God and the Son as some kind of demi-urge. Mm -hmm. Again, no better than an angel. They do 
uh, many Jehovah's Witnesses identify Jesus as with the angel or the archangel Michael. So they see Jesus as a uh, physical manifestation, manifestation of a spiritual being. Okay, they see Jesus as a, isn't this bizarre? Which, I mean, it's crazy. Which is also, if you go back through the church history, is followers of Arius and similar things made similar arguments back then that Jesus was a created spirit, divine spiritual being, uh, a celestial spiritual being, just like we think of angels. He was the best of the angels, but he was still created and still not divine. So this, again... This has been rejected this is, and disproved This has by the been, church. again, rejected by the ancient church. Uh, in other words, God the Father existed before God the Son. Number two, Jehovah's Witnesses deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus. They, deny, they boldly deny the physical resurrection of Jesus. Now, this makes sense if, if you're sticking with Jehovah's Witness theology. What is Jesus according to them? He's no better than an angel. angel, And an angel is a spiritual being. (laughs) So um, they believe that he only rose in spirit. Which again makes sense uh, if Jesus is just an angelic um, presence. Okay. Uh, So again, it is clearly a lessening of the sun. Here's another one. Uh, This one... I guess it, it, it fits with all the others. The cross is a pagan symbol. So, what do you never see on a Jehovah's Witness church? Cross. What do you never see on a Mormon church? Cross. Ah, we got some similarities here today. Okay, I'm serious. These churches... So, <laughs> I got to be careful here. Are there any mega churches out there that don't have crosses on their church or in their sanctuary? Oh, I, I believe it. Yeah, there are. Funny. Churches that don't have crosses should be shunned, <laughs> avoided. Avoid any church that doesn't have a cross. The cross is a pagan symbol adopted by the church when Satan took control. They say that Jesus was crucified on a pole. Um, so you do not see crosses in Jehovah's Witness churches um, to this day. They believe that the church, the New Testament church that exists right now is obsolete. Uh, that the uh, ancient church basically died mm-hmm. with the apostles. All right. Um, so Arius, um, oh, that is a misprint. So just forget that one. <laughs> Uh, that's obviously a cut and paste that I did, and uh, I already did that because uh, we already covered it. Questions or comments about Jehovah's Witnesses? Now, are there other strange things that uh, Jehovah's Witnesses believe? Yes. Uh, no blood transfusions. Uh, they believe that you're not supposed to celebrate birthdays. That is, that is a sin. Uh, they, they see pastors in the Christian church today as servants of Satan. Okay. True story. I mean, that's how Jehovah's Witnesses view us as clergy in the church today. We're we're instruments of Satan, exactly the way Mormonism does. Mormonism does the same thing. Uh, but we wanted to we wanted just to cover the the basics on Jesus. You know that that uh, right. if, if your if your Christology is messed up, if your understanding of Christ is is deviates from orthodoxy, then everything else falls apart. Correct. If Jesus is not fully God, then you, my friends, are not fully saved. saved. It can't happen any other way. Jesus had to be fully man. Why? Do do Galatians, right? Well, let's just let's just add. Yeah, we could do Galatians chapter four. Galatians four four. If y'all look that up real quick. Yeah, that that would that would probably be the best summary uh, text for. Why Jesus had to be fully, fully man. Let's see if I can find it. Galatians four for it. I have it memorized. I've got, I've got, I've got, it, I've got it synopsis for Paul Meyer. He, he he translates it in the fullness of time. God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Why did Jesus have to be fully human? So that he could redeem our humanity. So that he could redeem our flesh. Our flesh is under the curse of sin and pain and suffering. 
And if he doesn't come in the flesh to take on the pain and the suffering and the penalty that we, that we deserve in our sin, yeah. then we can't be saved. And why does he have to be fully God? Because only God can satisfy the demands of God. So what God demands, he supplies. Isn't that cool? What is the only religion in world history where God fulfills what he demands? What's the only religion? Christianity. Orthodox Christianity. You, you go to Islam, what does God demand of, of Muslims? The five pillars. The five pillars, or if you're Shiite, the six. Uh, if you go to the God, of, uh, if you go to the uh, the Buddhists, what does God demand? And it's, it's the eight, eight truths, eight, eight points of enlightenment. Eight points of enlightenment. I know right? it was eight. You go to the traditional God of the Jews. What does Yahweh demand? The Ten Commandments. Ten. So we went from five to eight to ten. We could just do this all day long. Mm-hmm. Every God in the world today demands, but only one God meets the demandment. He he fulfills the expectation, and that's the Christian God. So if you ever wondered why, you know, uh, which religion is the true religion, you're in the right place. <laughs> so uh, ours is, a, is, is truly a religion of grace, which is pretty cool stuff. Um, but anyway, there you go. Uh, moving on to Mormonism. Again, Mormonism has a lot of weird, um, just weird stuff. Mm-hmm. Baptism of the dead celestial marriage, magical underwear that temple Mormons have to wear when they go to uh, temple uh, worship. I mean, there's just a lot of weird stuff. Uh, You could go back to the very beginning. Joseph Smith, in 1823, was visited by an angel called Moron. No, Moroni. Oh, is it Moroni? Yeah, you're making a point. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I thought it was Moron. Maroni. Mac- Mar- macaroni? No, Maroni. Maroni I'm maybe. being mean. You're being mean. But let's face it. If you fall for this stuff, yeah. I mean, so um, Joseph Smith gets visited by the angel moron, E. and <laughs> Doubling down, huh? Keep going. He gets visited. <laughs> he gets visited. The angel reveals these, uh, these, these uh, divine texts. And Joseph Smith was suppo- supposedly, with some help from, uh, with a little help from my friends, a couple guys, uh, they write down the stuff. Of course, all these texts are lost now. No, no one knows where they are. They're, the the Moroni, uh, Moroni took them back up into heaven, took the golden tablets well, back Well, yeah, up but there heaven. was a translation oh, yeah, right. of the text um, that are supposedly buried somewhere in America. Um, uh, one, one, um, likely location is um oh independence missouri yep yeah one likely location for the um for the uh, for these texts is in independence missouri that that's not the church of jesus christ of latter day saints i believe it's the reformed mormons that are there by the way mormons have splintered into several groups but the um they they're all basically the same um in in theology so In Mormonism, Jesus is not divine. He is not from eternity. Again, what the Mormons, what Joseph Smith did was he lessened the son from the father. And so, uh, interestingly enough, Jesus has a pre-moral existence in heaven. His brother is Lucifer. Mm -hmm. In, in, In the traditional Mormon teachings... Jesus and Lucifer are brothers in their pre-mortal state. How do you like that one? Which gets into some weird Gnosticism it gets sort in, of stuff. It gets and... into some weird stuff here, okay? Now, does the average everyday Mormon know that Jesus and Lucifer were brothers? Probably not. Probably not. This is the deception that is taking place even within Mormonism today. There is no Christian denomination in America or around the world that acknowledges that Mormonism is a, an orthodox church body. Every single Christian denomination views them as a cult, except Mormons. And the U.S. government. And the U.S. government. <laughs> right. Fine. 
uh, as of 19, uh, around the turn of the millennium, is it millennium or millennium? It's millennium. Around the turn of the millennium, Mormons numbered uh, about the same as the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. That was like 20, you know, 22 years ago. Um, they have grown um, and we have not. So they're larger than we are as a, as a, as an or, as a church. I'm, I use this loosely for them as a church body. Yeah. Does that make Because the, the, the draw to works righteousness, the, the draw to doing something has a great appeal to people. Yeah. So uh, if you know the story, Jesus and Lucifer then come down into the world and Jesus lives the perfect life and he becomes a God himself. Uh, so they believe in a, um, I forget what the term is called, uh, but um, it is a, a type, a progression. It's a, uh, a type of a divine progression where you can become God yourself. Uh, this is why there's a great video, uh, well, I shouldn't say, it's dated now. I don't know if they've updated it, but there's a video out there called The God Makers uh, because Mormons have come to be known as the God Makers. So you can become your own God and reign over your own uh, world and have multiple wives and multiple children, which, according to traditional Mormon teaching, Jesus has. He has more than one wife and he has several children. <laughs> in his own new kingdom. Uh, number two, Jesus does not atone for individual sins. Just like Jehovah's Witnesses, the cross is a pagan symbol in Mormonism. What do you not see on Mormon churches? Instead, you see the angel Moroni. Moroni. I'll let y'all fill in the blank on that. Uh, this is a great quote from Lorenzo Snow. Who is Lorenzo Snow? He was one of the, uh, the prophets. Uh, by the way, uh, in Mormonism, they do believe in continuing revelation. So, for example, the president of the Mormon church can have a direct revelation from God and Scripture can change. I brought with me the two Book of Mormons that I have. This is the 50s version. This is the newer version from the 80s or the 90s, whatever. Since 1830, over 3,000 edits and changes have taken place for the Book of Mormon. In the 50s version, they were still uh, talking about African Americans as excluded from um, the priesthood. They've changed that. Makes sense. Makes sense. Because the president of the Mormon church had a direct revelation from God. All right. Uh, even in their history, uh, their historical, um, um, their, their historical, um, what's the word, storyline, their historical storyline, um, people of dark skin were the people who were cursed, the people of lighter skin are the people who are blessed. They've changed that. Which well, so so they've changed so, it for whatever reason. But to to say such a thing is to deny that the the universal atonement of Christ that Christ came for the sins of the whole world, right? So it's it's a, a symptom, right? Their Christology is messed up. Their way of salvation and forgiveness and what Jesus has come to do. That teaching was a symptom of this deeper issue about what who is Jesus? Is he fully God? Is he fully man? Or has he been subordinated under the Father? Is he a created being or not? Or did he really come to forgive the sins of the world? If he's come to do this lesser thing, then you can say all sorts of crazy stuff and change it whenever you want. But if you hold to the, the scriptural teaching, the teaching of the Orthodox faith, that Christ is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you might have eternal life, well, then you can't say those sorts of things. Or you're wrong if you say them. Yeah, and it's, um, it's bizarre. So Lorenzo Snow said this to give you some indication of how Jesus does not atone for individual sins. Lorenzo Snow said, As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. So in other words, you can earn divinity. You can literally work your way, and again, I forget the term, but it's uh, pr something progression. You can... Um, work towards divinity and become a god yourself. Uh, like Jehovah's Witnesses, there is no cross. 
Many Jehovah's Witnesses, or excuse me, uh, many Mormons believe that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. Oh, it was Judas. That right? Judas Iscariot went to the cross for him. They believe that Jesus came to the United States. True story. Mm-hmm. That's what the Book of Mormon tells the That's, story. This is the Book of Mormon. Of Jesus that, coming to the United he States. Tells, uh, they tell the story of how Jesus came to the United States and visited the Lamanites and the, um, the Labanites. I think, it's, I think it's... I forget. But it's yeah. Laman. Laman's the one guy, and I can't remember the... There were two brothers. Um, they came over, and um, long story short, um, the dark-skinned people... The evil people killed the white-skinned people. And folks, there is absolutely no archaeology. There is absolutely no geography. There is absolutely no history to confirm any of this. It is a complete fabrication. Mormons have literally walked away from Mormonism because of that. The deeper they got into this whole lie, the, the more they realized... This stuff is just all made up. That's right. It is. That's that's why you've got that's why you've got to have continuing revelation from your president, right, who can lead you and guide you. Um, they also, like the Jehovah's Witness, believe that the true church died with the apostles. So, um, if like so, basically, what we got going on here, just to kind of summarize. We're not going to get to that end today. We'll we'll incorporate that image. Uh, that's another conversation we'll incorporate into a, a later class. But uh, I will say this. You see the parallels between Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormonisms. Uh, Mormonism. Mormonism. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, organisms and Mormonisms. Yes. I'm getting it all mixed up. The bottom line here, that what you need to understand is like Arius, they have um, downgraded Jesus, if you will, They've made him less than fully divine. They still hold to this theology today. And because of it, there's no divine atonement. Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. Mm -hmm. Churches that don't have crosses are dangerous places. Uh, And I'm not saying we worship the cross. Uh, That's Mm -hmm. not my, you know, I know that there are... uh, (laughs) There's a, that's another conversation. Right. There are some Christians who believe we shouldn't have any images up at all. Uh, but we don't worship the cross. We don't worship the crucifix. It, that's a cross with the body of Jesus on it. Um, but those images point us to the truth that Jesus is fully God. He's fully man. And he has fully atoned for our sin. And it is simply through faith and faith alone. Right. So would you add anything? I would just say... so. Jehovah's Witness and Mormonism serve as the the institutional forms of Arianism, right? But it it still it shows up within our culture and the and the and the way that the culture says only the material stuff matters, that only the the, the physical stuff matters, and so any spiritual stuff doesn't count. And so, uh, do you remember all the the man on the street interviews when they say, "Oh, who do you think Jesus is?" and every Everybody agrees, even the most ardent atheists will still agree that Jesus existed, right? Like he, as a historical fact, there was a man named Jesus. He was a great rabbi. He was a great guru. He was a great ethical teacher. He was a great philosopher. Um, and so in that way, they've elevated him in, in his humanity, but they deny the divinity or yeah, they, they, yeah. they subordinate him. That's and so, right. So it's still percolates and still exists out in the in the popular mind right nobody the... would argue that jesus was a great man nobody's nobody's going to argue that i mean unless you're a satanist True. right you know you're you're in the church of wicca mm-hmm. uh but the i think most people will acknowledge you're right yeah. he was a great prophet a great guru a great speaker a great leader mm-hmm. rabbi but what and and they'll elevate him above the average ordinary Joe, but they lower him in his divinity by denying his true divinity. And, and, and C.S. Lewis said, you know, that this, in his writings, that it's the, the, the tri, he called it the trilemma, mm-hmm. the trilemma argument for Jesus. You've got three choices with Jesus. Either he is a liar 
or he is a lunatic, or he really is Lord. Because of the statements that he makes in the New Testament, you can't get past them claiming divinity. When he goes and says things like, I am the bread of life. I am the vine. You are the branches. I am the good shepherd. Um, he was claiming divinity. I am the way, the truth, and the I life. I am the way, the truth. I mean, it doesn't get any better than John 14, verse 6, right? No one comes to the Father except through me. me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a scandal. It's scandalous, the things that he says. Um, so uh, he's either a, a liar, he's a lunatic, or he really is who he says he is, and he is Lord. So, um, any questions or comments before we close? Don. Yeah, money, money has, a big, has a big role in the further and the further you get into Scientology and Mormonism. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, I don't think you get paid to be a Temple Mormon, but... The, you have to pay see, to be one. Yeah, you have to pay to be a Temple Mormon. And here's the part, um, you know, I said uh, on the study guide, uh, number, uh, Mormonism number two, Jesus does not atone for individual sins. The only way that you can atone for individual sins is by living a perfect life. You've got to live an, according to the rules that Mormonism has. It's the same thing in Jehovah's Witnesses. So your salvation is not dependent on Jesus. It is dependent on you and what you do. Um, so in Mormonism, that means, uh, I, um, I, I forget, there's a term that was used, uh, the ordinances. You've got to follow the ordinances of Joseph Smith. Uh, and those ordinances carry on today. You know, no caffeine. I think they changed that when they bought the largest Pepsi bottle. In the they might have changed that when they bought the largest. See, that's just it. I mean, again, since 1830, over 3,000 changes to the Book of Mormon. They probably changed it when they bought Pepsi, right, Coke? Yeah. But I think they, they probably, um, you know, that's where, you know, the, uh, the changes in those companies came in too. But if you have to follow those ordinances of Joseph Smith. You have to confess the gospel that he revealed and that he is the true church. So, yeah, that's where salvation comes from. Anyhow. Okay, uh, thanks for being patient with us. We started late and we're finishing late, so uh, we'll get back to it next week and we'll incorporate that image that's at the bottom of the second page. It's, a, it's an important image. We'll talk about what, what are the essential things that make a cult a cult and that make a, a, a denomination or a church a member of the true church. So, we'll, so you can kind of see what are those essential things that, that, are, that are part of that conversation. So go with the, uh, the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and forevermore. Amen.